David records again, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. That's the purpose of this psalm. That's why we're here this morning to learn from David how to repent, to learn from David how to recognize our sin and how to come back to a forgiving and compassionate and merciful God. You know, Psalm 51 not only touches our hearts, in David's very own sin, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit that he prays will not be taken from him to write these words as proof that the Spirit was not removed from David and that God's purpose, even in his sinful actions, which were horrible, don't want to minimize any of that, and he recognizes it too. But through that, the Holy Spirit was working so that we might be taught how to return to God when we have sinned. Not necessarily through adultery and murder like David, but in any way our rebellion has manifested itself. And since David wrote this psalm some 3,000 years ago, it's touched many, many hearts. It was recited in full by Sir Thomas More and Lady Jane Grey as they were martyred. Henry V had it read to him as he was laying on his deathbed. And William Carey, who was the father of the modern missionary movement, wanted this text preached at his funeral. Let me remind us of the details of the story that we considered last week, and then we're going to get into four decisive movements that Psalm 51 walks us through on how to return back to God when we have sinned against him. 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is the backdrop. Jason mentioned a few of those verses in his reading. Just a reminder, David isn't off to war when he's supposed to be, and he sees a woman on a rooftop named Bathsheba. She's a woman who was the son of Eliam and the wife of, Uri of, Ur of Uriah, who was a key military man for David, who was off at war while his king and commander wasn't. He sleeps with her, and, he, and Bathsheba becomes pregnant, which creates a really huge problem since Uriah's away at war, and it would be obvious that the baby was not his. So David seeks to cover it up, and he orders Uriah to come home from war, hoping that he will sleep with his wife, but he doesn't do it because... He will refuses to enter his house in accordance with David's own instructions concerning men at war earlier in the book of Samuel. And so while other men are at battle, Uriah, as a righteous and godly man, refuses to take part in the rest that would accompany such things. So he then, David then gets Uriah drunk in hopes that that will weaken his, weaken his resolve, but that doesn't work either. Eventually, he concocts a third cover-up in which he sends Uriah back into battle with a message for Joab, who's his main military commander. David arranges to have Uriah slain in battle by having the soldiers withdraw from him and expose him to the sword of the Ammonites. And it does not appear that Bathsheba knew what David was doing throughout this entire process. David ends up marrying Bathsheba. She later gives birth, and it appears that David has successfully hidden his sin for almost a year. But God eventually, in his mercy, sends a prophet named Nathan who shares an illustration that brings David to repentance. And in 2 Samuel 12, 7, some of the most familiar words in the Bible fly from the prophet's mouth at David as he says, you were the man. David's life had utterly exploded. He was guilty of murder, adultery, false witness, theft, and coveting. He broke all ten of the Ten Commandments. I could show you if we had time. And yet Nathan also tells David that miraculously somehow the Lord has put away his sin and he won't die. And though undeserved, David found loving kindness and forgiveness and out of deep gratitude he penned the greatest song of confession that has ever been written by any human being, Psalm 51. And so we're going to consider Psalm 51 this morning and the four decisive movements that Psalm 51 give us toward the path of forgiveness and cleansing and restoration. Some of us this morning will need to follow the path of Psalm 51 for the first time. Some of us will need to follow it again, and we will continue to follow this sort of path until we meet the Lord one day and are free from all remnants of remaining sin. May that day come soon. <laughs> Every one of us who are in Christ would wish for that day to be done, for sin and the struggle with sin is the plague of our existence. <laughs> First movement, there is chaos in our soul. There is chaos 
in our soul. David uses three different words in these opening verses of Psalm 51 to describe what sin is. And then he describes three words to describe the path of, to forgiveness that he requests. And I want to spend just a few moments talking about each one of those words that he uses. They demand and require careful analysis. Look at the first two verses of Psalm 51 again. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Do you see the three words he uses there to describe his actions? Transgression, iniquity, sin. Let's talk about each one of those words briefly. The first word he uses is transgression. Transgression is a rebellious action that is intentional and willful. And that would certainly describe David's actions, wouldn't it? Everything he, did, he, he did, everything he did, he did with malice aforethought. He was planning it, he was executing it, and then he was trying to intentionally and willfully cover it all up. And the plural that David uses here is significant, not accidental. David has committed multiple transgressions, not just one. David in his sin has willfully rebelled against the commandments of God. Specifically, he, he cites defiantly breaking five of them. And I mentioned those earlier. Murder, adultery, false witness, theft, and coveting. We've been making our way through the Ten Commandments in our congregational readings. And so let's just think about how David deliberately transgressed these five. Exodus 20 verse 13 says, you shall not murder. How did David do that? Well, he took the, wife, took the life of Uriah. Innocent shed in cold blood by God's enemies at David's own direction. Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery while he slept with Bathsheba, who was not his wife. Exodus 20, 15, you shall not steal. He stole Bathsheba, stole another man's wife, and marrying her after the adultery. Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. He lied and he tried to conceal and hide his sin by making it appear that Uriah was the father of the child in Bathsheba's womb. And then finally, Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He saw Bathsheba, he desired her, he took her. He broke the entire second table of the law. And realistically, in order to break the last five commandments, David had to first break the first five, didn't he? You have to rebel against God in order to rebel against men. He broke the first commandment in his unbelief. Unbelief was his very first sin. He failed to love God, but instead he showed sinful self-love, and he was self-seeking. He broke the second commandment. God was to be worshipped in a particular manner, which included what David was commanded to do, namely be away at war as God's king, as well as what God was commanded, or what David had, was commanded by God not to do. But David transgressed these laws. He also broke the third commandment. As God's son and God's image bearer, David brought dishonor upon his father. He broke the fourth commandment. David did not rest in God, but instead engaged in sinful leisure, resting when he should have been working. Six days you shall labor, David. This is one of those days. You're resting. He broke the Sabbath by failing to work when God had called him to work, not simply to rest when God had called him to rest. He broke the fifth commandment. God did not, David did not honor his parents, but brought shame upon his family name by his actions. He divided his entire family as a result of his sin. And James 2.10 then remains an apt summary. For whoever breaks, keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, that's the first word, and that should be sufficient. David transgressed. He went over the, over the boundary into forbidden territory by God. But secondly, he committed iniquity. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity in verse 2. It means to bend or twist. Iniquity literally means to pervert or to go astray or depart from the right path. It speaks of the internal sickness that sin that, that, that leads to external transgression in our sin. We sin because we are bent and twisted, and deep down every sin is a perversion that is in us. Yes, in some sense, we are all perverted, broken, twisted, messed up on the inside that leads us astray 
and departing from the right path. David took a good gift from our great God, which was the gift of sex, and he turned it into a perversion of immorality. He took the good gift of sex, which is to be enjoyed in the covenant of marriage, and he departed from that right path down the avenue of adultery. Thirdly, the third word that David uses is the common word that we use, which is sin. Sin means to miss the mark, to miss the goal, to miss the right way. David missed the mark. He took life rather than saving life. He lied rather than telling the truth. He took what was not his rather than give out of his wealth and abundance to those who needed it. And in any direction you look or turn, David saw and experienced grief and pain and anguish over his sins. Indeed, he says in verse 3, my sin is always before me. I can't get it out of my mind what I have done in my rebellion to the Lord. And to this trio of words, transgression, iniquity, sin, David adds a fourth one in verse 4. I have done what is evil in your sight. So what does he ask for? What does this chaos in his soul led him to do? Well, he says in verse 1, have mercy on me. Withhold from me, Lord, what I deserve. Alleviate my suffering. It's a command. He's commanding, in a sense, God. It's an urgent request on David's behalf. Be gracious to me, he says to God. Show me favor. Do not give me what I deserve. And what's the basis of his request? The fact that David is God's king? The fact that God chose him to lead Israel? No. He says, according to your steadfast love, in verse 1. It has nothing to do with me, David says. God, you are unfailing in your love and your covenant faithfulness and your compassion and your kindness knows no limits. Show that to me, one who does not deserve it. Blot it out, he says. That is, change the record book to show that there is no moral blemish on my life. There's no legal liability that I have toward you. Remove and wipe clean my slate Sin is seen here by David as some sort of insurmountable debt that he cannot pay. It can only be forgiven. And he's right about that. So he says, wash me, Lord. Cleanse me. Give me an inner renewal of soul and heart. Sin is a stain that needs to be laundered, a defilement of dirt that needs to be removed, and I need to be thoroughly washed. I need to be bleached out of my sin. So David pleads for the Lord to wash him completely, to cleanse me, he says, is actually a, a temple term for religious ritual cleansing that the priests would have used to describe. Sin is seen as this sort of infectious disease that has spread all over David's soul and it kills him and it will continue to kill him if it's not cured. And this is how David felt. This is the chaos he's experiencing on the inside. And this is where David stood before the Lord. Dear ones, if there's not a measure of this struggle in our own hearts, we will never get on the path toward restoration. If there's not an internal turmoil in our lives that our sin has produced, it doesn't have to, let me commit, David went way, way far here. So he's having some way, way, way far emotional reactions to this, rightly so. But our sin should produce in us unsettledness. We should not be able to coast in the face of our sin. If, it, if that's the case, it's because we're dulling our conscience to it. But we should have a measure of this. We should have discomfort and, disqui and, and disquiet and turbulence and, of, of, and, and feel like we are being afflicted in, in our sin because we are. So there's the chaos in soul. That's where, that's where it starts, but that's not where it ends. But we continue to point number two. There is confession of our guilt. There is confession of our guilt. What things does David admit here and how does each contribute to a complete portrait of his repentance? Well, first of all, look at verse 3, and notice how he takes full responsibility for his actions. Verse 3, he says, for I know my transgressions. Now, that know is not just in my head, I realize, but I am intimately acquainted in all the ways I've sinned against you, God. I know it. I feel it. Now, he doesn't know every way he sinned against God, but he knows the big ones. And he says, my sin is ever or always in front of me. I can't get it out of my head. I can't get it out of my mind. He's not blame shifting. The I in verse 3 is emphatic. He says, I know my transgressions. My sin is in front of me. 
David is saying, I, myself, deeply and intimately am constantly in full knowledge of my sin, Lord. I could not escape it if I tried. It's with me every moment of my day. I wake up thinking about it and I can't sleep at night because the guilt is so heavy. I see the filth of my immorality. I hear the last cry of brave Uriah as he's slain. I can't get his voice out of my head, God. I touch the dead body of my little baby, God, that you took as judgment for my sin. In my mind, in my heart, in my body, in my soul, there is no escape. So he takes full responsibility for it. But secondly, he admits that his sin was primarily against God and against no one else. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now that is not to minimize the seriousness of the sin that he has committed both against Bathsheba and Uriah. They were sinned against. They were victims of David's sin. But David, it's not that David is not thinking about them. It's that he's thinking about them so much that he realizes that it's ultimately God that he has sinned against. This is shocking in certain ways because he obviously did sin against Bathsheba and Uriah and really the whole nation of Israel. What does he mean then? Well, he does not mean that God was the only one he sinned against but that his primary sin was against God himself. The fact that sin is primarily against God is what is meant, it was what makes it particularly offensive. See, if sin was only what hurt others, an eternity in hell would not be justified. But because sin is against an infinitely worthy God, it demands an infinite punishment because it's, sin, it's not how often we have sinned, it's who we have sinned against that's the issue. What makes sin, sin, is that it grieves and offends God. If we repent over the consequences of our sin, like I hurt people, I won't be able to rule Israel, I failed my own standards, I have low self-esteem, if that were David's response, then we're not really repenting of the sin itself. We're only sorry for what has happened to us as a result of the sin. That's not repentance, that's self-pity. If this is all that's happening in our heart, then we will avoid the sin in the future if it hurts us. Only if it hurts us, but not the sin itself. Because the sin itself has not become ugly enough to us, and it has not lost its attractive power over us. If, however, we repent over the fact that sin has broken God's heart and dishonored the one to whom we owe everything, then we will begin to find the sin itself heinous. It will lose its power and we will be cleansed and free to change. But David says in verse 4, he's justifying God. He says you may, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He rightly acknowledges that he is the one in the wrong and God is the one in the right. He rightly says, God, you're righteous. You have done the right thing in punishing me for my sin. Whatever the verdict ends up being over my life, Lord, let it be mercy because it's not what I deserve. What I deserve is your judgment. In essence, he says that what you say about my sin, God, is true, and how you judge my sin is right, God. David confesses that no one can find fault with God's verdict and judgment of sinners and their sin. In verse 5, David now gets to the root, the source of our sin problem. Notice what he says in verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. You say, is he shifting blame now? He's been talking about how he's responsible for his sin, but now he's kind of blaming his mom. No. Bottom line, David's saying, I came into this world as a sinner. And we all did, with a nature that was bent toward sin. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. There was nothing sinful about my conception or my birth or about yours. There was something sinful about me, even in my conception and my birth. David says that from my beginning, from the very point of my existence, there has never been a time that I was not in a sinful state with sin as my close companion. I inherited it from Adam in the very moment of conception. I did not come into this world positive or neutral in my nature. I came kicking and screaming as a little sinner who would grow up to be a big sinner. Adam's sin marked me, and I've lived with it all my life. And kids, we need to know this about ourselves, don't we? The reasons that we hurt our brother and sister or the reasons that we say mean things or the reasons that we're selfish have nothing to do ultimately with our brother or sister or our environment or our house. It has to do with us. 
It has to do with the fact that we were born in a sinful condition of heart. We had a broken heart from the very beginning that is bent on ourselves. And only Jesus can give us that new one, and we need to ask him to change us and save us from that. So what is inside a man in the inward parts is the crucial issue, David says. It's amazing what he's talking about here, isn't it? The way he's psychoanalyzing himself is amazing. He's saying, look, Lord, it's not just all this stuff out there that that needs to get fixed. It's me. I'm the problem, God. It's me. And that's tremendous self-knowledge and a tremendously accurate self-diagnosis. Because until we get there, we won't get healed. (laughs) Until we say, Jesus, I'm the problem. I'm not every problem, but I'm a big problem. I bring bring the problem to my problems. (laughs) Because I bring me to everything. Help me, cleanse me, fix me, that David says. And this stands in such sharp contrast to our culture, doesn't it? That is at at every single moment seeking to deflect blame somewhere else. And sometimes that's for good reason, because there are legitimate victims, and there is real wrong and sin done against people, and we don't need to dismiss that. But that is never, ever the posture that we're to have ultimately in our lives. If we live that way, we will never see Jesus as a Savior that he is offering himself to be, because we'll always be avoiding him by throwing our sin on somebody else. And we need to be able at the end of the day to say, yes, I've been sinned against, I've been wounded, people have treated me wrong, but I've sinned against God, and I'm a wicked sinner from the womb. And if we can't get there, and we can't own that, then we'll never experience true healing, no matter how many therapy sessions we have. And sometimes some of us need therapy. It's good, not a bad thing, as long as it's ultimately pointing us to redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a place for medical care. There's a place for medication and physical help and addressing all kinds of issues and mental health and all that stuff. It's all important. But at the end of the day, if the category of sin is not there and the recognition of sin is not there and the repentance from sin and the clinging to Christ is not a part of that whole situation, we won't ultimately make progress. David recognizes that what God desires is truth in the inward parts, he says in verse 6, and that he would know wisdom, be taught God's wisdom in the secret or hidden part of his heart. And God's plan and purpose for David from the womb is that he would embrace God's truth and God's knowledge, and he has rejected it. In spite of God's desire for David, he sinned because he'd been a sinner by nature from birth. And God has wired all of us on the inside with the capacity for truth and knowledge, but foolishly and contrary to God's design, we sin. He desires truth, but we are people of lies. He desires faithfulness, but we are people of foolishness. Only by being purged of the ravaging effects of sin and made clean can we embrace God's truth and walk in his wisdom. And this is why confession is so important. Confession literally is agreeing with God about what he says about us. That's where confession starts. Okay, so when David confesses his guilt, all he's doing in these verses is saying, God, you're right. Everything you've done is right. What you've said about my sin is right. It wasn't an affair. It wasn't a, it was an adult, it was adultery. It was a lie. It was theft. It was coveting. He calls the sin what the sin is. He doesn't redefine it to help him ease his guilty conscience. So we just need to own it. We need to call sin what it is. And David models for us exactly how to do that. So two, first two steps are done. There's chaos in his soul. There's confession of his guilt. But that's not where it stops, because the the trajectory of this psalm is going to move marvelously upward toward hope as as he comes out of this confession, because it all hinges right there. Chaos, confession, leads to what? Number three, calling on our God. Calling on our God. David has confessed his sin. Now he wants to get rid of it. He wants to forsake it. He wants it out of his life. He has experienced redemption, and now he wants renewal and restoration, If he has to go forward and not backward in his relationship with God, then he needs several important gifts from God that God alone can give him. The same is true for us and our relationships with the Lord as well. Three wonderful gifts are offered by God that we need to ask him for. First of all, like he does in the opening verses, David asks, first of all, for the gift of cleansing. God, wash me. 
He says in verse 7, purge me. (laughs) That's stronger than wash. That is, kick it out. Get it completely out of my life. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. He says, I want a, a full body cleanse. I want it gone. Purge me. Cleanse me. Hyssop now is not a, language, a word we throw around a lot, unless we accidentally cough and it sounds like that. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. All right. Hyssop was a small, leafy shrub um, that was used as a brush to sprinkle and splatter blood or water in rituals of purification in the temple. So when David says, purge me with hyssop, he's saying, allow your blood to cleanse me from my sin. The blood of the sacrifice to cleanse me. Lepers in particular would come before a priest and go through a a ceremony with hyssop to be cleansed from their outer uncleanness so that they could come into the temple. And David asked the Lord to cleanse him like a leper, to cleanse him completely from his sin, to remove this disease-like effect that sin has in his life and in his heart. He says that God, he asked God to wash him and in so doing make him whiter than snow. And picking up on this idea from washing in verse 2, this washing would result in a clean David, a freshly showered, newly cleaned, spotless David. Every spot and stain of sin would be washed away, resulting in a a soul that was as white as snow. So he asked, first of all, God to wash him. That's what we should call on God to do as well. Lord, wash me, cleanse me from my sin. Secondly, he asked that God would make him glad again. Look at verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's known many sad days, hasn't he? Because of his sin. And we know sad days because of ours too. He wants to know the joy of the Lord once again. David uses this powerful image to convey the joy of forgiveness. He says the bones that God has broken in conviction, he wants God to heal and restore. Put a cast on them, God. Allow them to heal again. Do your surgery so that my, the broken bones in my soul are fixed. His spirit, which has been crushed, can now praise the Lord for the free and undeserved forgiveness that's been given to him by God. So he wants God to make him happy again. Not just happy in circumstances, but happy in his salvation. See, dear ones, that's what leads us into sin to begin with. And that's the fruit of our sin. If we were satisfied in Christ and happy and joyful in all that we have in Him, we wouldn't be tempted by other things. And when we are, we depart from that and we lose a measure of that. And David's asking, Lord, restore that to me. I want to know the joy of the Lord again. And isn't that a great prayer? And that's something we can experience. We can have it again. It's not, a permanently, it's not permanently removed from us. In verse 9, the third gift he asked for is that God would turn away his face and not think about David's sin ever again. It says, hide your face. Look at verse 9. It says, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Now, of course, at one level we know God's omniscient and all-seeing, all-knowing, all-seeing. He can see it. He never forgets it. He can't forget it. But what he's asking God to do is do this. Put something in front of your face so that when you see me, you don't see my sin. And dear ones, we have that in Christ. God has put something in front of his face that hides our sins from his gaze. And it's called the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that when he looks at us, he doesn't see the filthy, rotten, sinner that we feel ourselves to be he sees one who has been made perfect in the lord jesus christ he sees christ when he looks at you greatest gift in the world greatest gift in the world in the language of psalm 103 david wants god to remove his sins as far as the east is from the west so far that he doesn't even think about him anymore and Micah, using the language of Micah 7, to trample his sins underfoot, to put his sins behind his back, to toss them, as Micah 7 says, in the depths of the sea. Wonderful visions of what it means to, for God to put, his sins out of, put our sins out of his mind. Put them in the depths of the sea, God. Remove them as far as the east is from the west. Trample them underfoot. Put them behind your back. God does all of that for us in Christ. 
Our sins are behind his back. They're not in front of him. They're in the depths of the sea. He's not going down and digging them up and bringing them back. He's tossed them down there. He's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. You can't get any farther than that. That's the point. As soon as you go further enough east, you start going west. Well, that's wherever that point is is where God's put them. As far away from him and us as could possibly be. It's a glorious picture of forgiveness. And then David asked God to create in him, to create in him a clean heart in verse 10. It is God's work of creation whereby he produces something new. And this is something only God can do. He want, David wants a spirit that is steadfast in its devotion to God, not dull or wavering or prone to sin, and he knows he can't produce that himself. He looks to God and says, God, I want you to give me this heart. I want you to give me a singleness of spirit. I want you, your Holy Spirit, to bring me to a place of renewed and deeper intimacy with you. He says in verse 11, cast me not away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but uphold me, verse 12, with a willing spirit. If I'm going to make progress here, God, it's going to have to be by grace and grace alone. We sang it this morning. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And David knows that too. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. Unless you give me what I need, I won't be able to do what you want me to do. And his prayer is that God would not withdraw his enabling spirit as he did with Saul in 2 Samuel 16, but that he would allow his spirit to remain on him to strengthen him, to empower him, to guide him as he led the nation of Israel as their king. And we know it was common in the old coven, under the old covenant for the spirit to come and go, right? The spirit would come upon a king for a period of time, then leave him, like in Saul's case. And David knew that was the case with Saul. But praise the Lord, under the new covenant, Jesus says, I will give my helper to be with you always. <laughs> He's never going. The spirit's never going to go away from us. Now, we can lose our felt sense of his presence for sure, but he's always there. He's there. And so we can take comfort that when God saves us and guarantees us with the down payment of the Holy Spirit, that he's never going to take the Holy Spirit from us. We can pray this differently. We can pray, Lord, not that you would take your Holy Spirit from me, but do not allow me to grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not allow me to quench the Holy Spirit. Do not allow me to do things that are contrary to what the Spirit is wanting to do in my life. Help me to fight the works of the flesh so that the fruit of the Spirit can be cultivated in my life. We battle differently because we have the Spirit, and He's not going anywhere. We need to pray that we would yield to Him, yield to His influences, and fight against everything that's contrary to His desires in our life. So that's the three big steps here. Chaos in the soul, confession of His guilt, and then a calling upon his God. But here's the fourth and final one, change in, our, change in our lives. It results in a change in our lives. Having asked God for forgiveness and cleansing, he now concludes by resolving with God's help to change in light of his confession. Several vows are voiced to God, indicating David's desire to be a new man and to live a new life. Let's look at the, what he says here in verse, first of all, in verse 13, notice what he says. We've already seen it at the beginning of the sermon. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will return to you. He says to God, God, my forgiveness has an evangelistic purpose. I think of what Paul said in 1 Timothy, right? He said, I was a blasphemer, an insolent opponent. I was the chief of sinners. And he says, but this was to show that God could have mercy on anybody. And that's what David is saying to God. Forgive me so that no one will be without hope that they can be forgiven. Isn't that amazing? That's glorious. He says, Lord, forgive me, not just for my own sake, but for the sake of a testimony in the world that you are a good and forgiving God. I want the world to know that, and I want people to know that no, there's never a moment that you're hopeless. You can go as far as I've gone and further. I mean, adulterous murder is pretty bad, pretty bad far and he said but if if you can forgive me you can forgive anybody and so he's prepared to tell his story and he's already told it and sinners are getting healed and people are getting brought into the kingdom through this psalm ever since he wrote it god answered david's prayer didn't he his testimony in these words which is so vulnerable would we want this do you want your private 
prayer journal read publicly? David says, go ahead and do it. If it will benefit the saints, do it. If it will help people come to God and get forgiven, do it. And he does. Not only are the, his actions recorded, but his confession is recorded for us. That's a mark of a changed person, isn't it? When we're not ashamed to own what we have done and say, I'm the man. My sin is great, but God is greater, and his grace is greater. And we stand in the righteousness of Christ, and we say, go ahead, devil. Throw your darts at me. They won't last. Go ahead. Try to blot my name out of the book. We, we take that Romans 8 kind of posture. Who can say that we're condemned? Christ is the one who justifies. The, our, the love of God will never depart from me. We can take that Romans 8 courage right into, the, right into God's presence and in the face of the devil and all those who would be opposed, and even in the face of our own sin, and say, the Lord is good and gracious and forgives. So as a renewed and restored and broken and contrite David, he says, I'm going to teach other people your ways, and as a result of my actions, people are going to return to you, God. He promises God that he will not keep the grace he has received to himself, he says, I will teach them your word and the promise of your forgiveness and the power of your cleansing, and I will instruct others regarding how gracious you are to people who've sinned against you. I will tell them about the joy of your salvation and hearing of your grace and goodness. Sinners will repent and return and be converted to you. What he has experienced in grace, he promises God, I will share it with others. And we need to take the same promise. We say, Lord, I'm not going to hold back from others what you've done for me. I will share some details of my sin with others and your forgiveness of that sin if it will help them understand that you are a gracious and forgiving God and will receive them just as you've received me. Let's be ready to do that. God wants us to do that. If he forgives us, he wants it broadcasted. And the first way we do it is in our baptism. But then we go on doing it as we have opportunity to give testimony to his goodness and his grace in our lives. And not only is he prepared to teach others, He's prepared to praise God anew with a new vigor and a new zeal than he ever had before. Look at verses 14 and 15. He says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will what? Sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth is going to declare your praise. Full forgiveness always leads to public praise. His guilty conscience had shamed him into silence. His lips were sealed shut because of his sin. Guilt glued his, the, 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 his tongue to the roof of his mouth. But oh, what forgiveness brings. It frees us to praise God in great joy and liberty. He says in verse 16, For you would not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and hard, contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Tell me a time in the Gospels where our Lord Jesus Christ despised a broken or contrite heart. You do not see it. You will not find it because he is God. And that's why, the way God responds to people who fall at his feet and say, cleanse me and forgive me. He says, oh yes, I will. And he does it with joy and with eagerness. And all of heaven breaks out in joy. Why? Because heaven is a place that celebrates forgiven sinners. And that's why all of heaven, heaven wouldn't break out if they thought, don't do that. The master gets mad at us when we do that. Right? No, they know it brings joy to the master to celebrate when sin gets forgiven. The master's leading the song. He pulled the guitar out and said, guys, let's stand up and sing. David just got forgiven. And so, hearing of this grace, it sets the soul free and it liberates the lips and it causes us to worship God. Broken in spirit is the best posture for great worship. A new song of praise is born in the soul every time. And he wants his sin to bring a change in him, not just that it would bring a change in others or it would lead him to praise, but he wants to be different as a result of this and he wants it to change Israel as a whole. This is where we conclude. Look at verses 18 and 19. He says, do good to Zion, to Jerusalem, to Israel in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. 
he, he, he's not just praying for himself. He's praying, do good to all your people through this, God. Take what was evil that I did and do incalculable good through it. You know, God's the master at that. That's why the cross happened. Because God is able to take something that is evil and turn it in miraculous ways for good. To use the crucifixion of his only son to save a lost and dying world. So David says, my sin didn't affect me alone. I did not sin in a vacuum. I sinned in such a way that if you let my sin bleed out and affect this nation, Israel's going down as a result of my behavior. His sin hurt him, it hurt Uriah, it hurt Bathsheba, and it hurt the nation of Israel. It has far-reaching consequences upon others. So David pleads with God not to pour out the corporate consequences of his sin upon the nation. Oh Lord, please build up what I and my sin have torn down. And dear ones, does this not tell us that character counts in leadership? That what people do in their private lives has an effect on those they govern. We used to believe that. I'm not sure we do anymore. Let's not deny the Bible, okay? There's always a cost to pay when wicked people govern us, wicked in their character, no matter what side of the political aisle they're on. And David knows that. And that's why he says, Oh Lord, please build up what I and my sin have torn down. Don't let my sin lead to punishment upon this community. Instead, David pleads for God to prosper the nation. While living in sin, sacrifices are merely religious legalism. But as the nation follows David in repentance, they begin to offer right sacrifices as a reflection of faith-filled hearts. And this all ends so beautifully. So we should ask, how's God able to do this? How's God able to forgive David like this? Most people don't ask that question. They assume God owes us forgiveness, that it's his job. And Nathan almost makes it seem that way in the words that he says. When he says, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. You see a problem with that? I do. Just like that? Uriah's dead, Bathsheba's raped. Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. Just like that? He committed adultery, he committed murder, he lied, he coveted, he despised the word of the Lord, he scorned God, but the Lord has put away your sin. What kind of righteous God is that? If, if we don't think at some level that sounds like a God that's just as unrighteous as the David he claims is his. Because he's just overlooking sin. Not a big deal. Covering it up. We can move on. But that's not what the Lord's doing here. You don't just pass over rape and murder and lying. Righteous judges don't do that. So how can God forgive David's sin? Well, David faced some heart-wrenching consequences for his sin, as we've seen, the death of his son, ongoing family tension, civil war. But through the ensuing marriage to Bathsheba, God would provide another son, a son named Solomon. And he'd be the next king, and ultimately in the line of Christ. And in the first chapter of Matthew, we read the following as part of Jesus' own family history. And Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. Our God is a God who redeems David through the sin that David committed. That's how our God works. This is our God. He's able to use David's own sin as a means of purchasing the forgiveness of David's sin because his very son is listed and Bathsheba is listed in the family tree of Jesus. Jesus comes through this sin. He comes into the world through this sin. Wonder of wonders. How can this happen? God sees from the time of David down the centuries to the death of his son Jesus Christ who would die in David's place so that David's faith and God's mercy and God's future redeeming work would unite David with Christ. And in God's all-knowing mind, David's sins are counted as Christ's sins, and Christ's righteousness is counted as his righteousness, as David's righteousness, and God justly passes over David's sin. Like black threads woven into a beautiful fabric, God incorporates our sin 
into accomplishing his good purposes as another one of David's sons would be born to die for his sin centuries later. And his name was Jesus of Nazareth. His mercy is more. Always more. Let's pray. Father, thank you for mercy. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for the ways in which you do not treat us according to our sins, but you use the sins we commit against you in marvelous ways to bring us back to you, and even in David's case, to purchase his own forgiveness. As one would be born from his own family centuries later, who would bear your wrath for his very sins that he committed. Jesus was treated as the adulterer. Jesus was treated as the murderer. And all of our sins, not just David's sins, but all the sins of anyone who would ever believe in him were laid upon that son of David. That daughter of, or that son of Bathsheba who would redeem us from all of our sin. And thank you that that even testifies to your goodness to Bathsheba. That even though she was sinned against and she was violated, in that very act, she was in the family line of Jesus Christ. She would have her suffering redeemed for a good purpose because she would be in the family tree. She's listed. The wife of Uriah is listed. And it's in part to say, you're saying to her and to us, I know you. I know what's been done to you. I pay attention to sin against my people. And I will redeem them. Thank you for your kindness to us, God. Thank you for your mercy. For those of us who are outside of this covenant this morning, of this gracious relationship that we enjoy with you, would you draw people? Would you answer David and our prayers that sinners would return to you as a result of Psalm 51 this morning? And for all of us, in all of our various struggles with sin, would you draw us closer? Would you call us back to you? Would you incline our hearts towards you through what we've witnessed in the chaos and the confession and the calling and the change that David experienced in his own, in his own life through this sin? May we find hope. May we find the joy of our salvation again. And may you restore in Jesus' name. Amen.